Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon. We have a fantastic show for you tonight. George Brawley is here of General Aviation Modifications, otherwise known as GAMI. And we are going to have an amazing time uh, picking his brain, learning about the history of GAMI, and of course, talking about alternative fuels and what's coming for general aviation. Before we get started, just a few quick housekeeping tips, of course. Um, tonight's broadcast is qualifying for WINGS program. This is the first time that Social Flight Live has qualified for WINGS. And moving forward, other programs, depending on the topic and whether it applies to pilot or mechanic knowledge, will also apply for WINGS program uh, credit. All you need to do is make sure that you are registered and logged into the Social Flight Live program using the same email that you actually use on the FAA's Fast Team website. As long as it's the same email, it automatically happens. Will take us probably about a week to make that happen. You'll see it in your FAA account. No need to follow up. Everything will happen automatically. In addition to that, of course, as we now approach uh, the winter months, we also want you to check out socialflight.com and the free Social Flight mobile apps for Apple and Android devices. We have tens of thousands of aviation events and destinations to keep you flying as the temperatures drop, but also keep you engaged and learning in things that apply to maintenance for your aircraft and operations for pilots. And so with that, right now we have the Fly to Win Challenge going on. You just have to have the Social Flight mobile app and for free, you fly anywhere, it'll check you in, give you points, and you'd be entered to win. And we have a prize pack from Tempest Aero, and it's got all sorts of cool things for an aircraft owner, very, very cool, whole set of spark plugs and case of four filters and tools, you name it. Very, very cool stuff. And again, all you need to do is have the free Social Flight mobile app. You're entered, and then you can move forward from there. So with that, GAMI was founded in 1994 by aeronautical engineers George Brawley and Tim Rail in order to obtain an STC to install balanced fuel injectors on Continental Motors engines and also get the parts manufacturing approval, otherwise known as the PMA, to actually produce and sell them. And since that time, the company has been the leader in engine technology solutions, including their Tornado Alley turbo conversions, engine cooling STCs, and now what may become the savior for the coming 100 low lead fuel crisis, and that is the alternative fuel from GAMI that George is gonna talk about tonight. And so with that, please welcome here to the show, George Raleigh. How are you doing, George? Good evening, pleasure to be here. So thank you so much for joining us. It's it's very exciting. There is, there is I will say right up front to everyone who is on the line, there is more that we could talk about here than we could ever accomplish in a one hour program. And so I'm gonna let everybody know, we will be back with another episode, and we'll talk about all, all sorts of different stuff until we slowly, slowly chip away at picking some more of your brain. But tonight, we'll focus on, on the history and, and alternative fuels. And with that, I mean, you're one of my heroes. Tell me how you actually, how you got started in aviation, how you started GAMI and got us to this point. Um, started in aviation. <laughs> Uh, I was uh, in Houston, Texas for, well, no, I got started in aviation by building plastic model airplanes. Excellent. And then, you know, I flew the U-Control thing, you know. Uh, but uh, in, uh, I don't know, 64 or something, my oldest brother was getting married and I was down at his uh, wedding and we had some spare time and he'd just gotten his private license. He took me for a ride in a Piper Cub. <laughs> Talk about starting at the beginning. Yeah. So I had the bug, and uh, I'm here in a little town in southeastern Oklahoma called Ada. It's uh, right in the heart of the old uh, President Andrew Jackson Indian Territory. And on, I think, June the 7th of 1965, I soloed a uh, Cherokee 160 on runway 17 here. Um. Wow, so all based there in Ada, isn't that cool? And so, well, I, you know, I, I was actually uh, uh, 
uh, going to school uh, at a very good uh, uh, private school. I had parents that grew up on a red dirt farm in Oklahoma, and that they believed in education. And oh, uh, God bless them, they made sure I got one. Uh, so I ended up getting my private certificate uh, uh, in March, just about my birthday of my senior year in high school. Uh, and then went on to uh, uh, to do an aerospace engineering degree at Brown University. Uh, I kind of helped restart the flying club at Brown. And uh, then I had this just marvelous experience where I, I used to go to the local, the, to the university library every Wednesday evening. And I'd go over there and sit down and wait in the magazine room till they put the new magazines out for Wednesday. And that always included the latest edition of Aviation Week and Space Technology. And I'd get it and read it. Sometime in March of my, of my freshman year, there was an article in there about this really cool airplane that had picture of sitting out on the ramp at the Van Nuys Airport. And it was this cool airplane that had a fuselage and a mid-wing and two Lycoming 180 horsepower engines on it. And it was called what was it? Oh, an Aerostar <laughs> built by some guy named Ted Smith that I'd never heard of before. So uh, uh, I wrote a letter out there and asked him for a, a, a job as a young engineer. I said, well, I had one class in ninth grade in drafting, so I ought to be able to fill in for somebody in drafting. That's pretty presumptuous. Uh, and they told me no. And my oldest brother said, well, you write him another letter. He said, uh, who, who signed that letter? And I told him, he said, well, that was Ron Smith. That was Ted Smith's son. He said, write Ron Smith back another letter and tell him that his fraternity brother, Mac Brawley, told him he ought to hire my baby brother. Because <laughs> when Ted Smith was building Aero Commanders in Oklahoma City, his son went to University of Oklahoma, happened to be a fraternity brother with my older brother. So I got a summer job. <laughs> <laughs> When I went to work out there, I was employee number 35. Uh, that summer, I got my CFI ticket, multi-engine, did aerobatics, uh, all that stuff. But starting from employee number 35 with one airplane flying and one airplane on the test stand, when I left there after three summers, they'd built a new factory. There was 1,400 employees, and they were delivering 30 Aerostars a month. Wow. And you I got to watch that. You know, you know, incrementally, twelve months at a time, and spend three months out there, and you know what an education for a young engineer. Uh, you know, it was it was it was just fantastic. And then, of course, when I went back to to school at Brown, I think I was the only engineering student that had a real job off campus, and so I was working as a flight instructor and teaching businessmen around Providence that had their their own airplanes and sometimes primary students on the weekends. So yeah, I mean, you know, listen. I was getting 15 bucks an hour in 1967 when the minimum wage was 55 cents. I mean, what a deal. <laughs> wow. It must have been amazing to see how an inspirational to, to some of the work that, that you did to build your own company to see how fast things would move back then. I mean, that timetable you're describing of Ted Smith and the Aerostar moving from, from one airplane on the ground and one on the test stand to shipping aircraft in that many years, we, you go to Oshkosh and see pipe dreams all day long compared to the, the, that kind of speed these days. Yep, and and you know, I got to work with a bunch of really good engineers. And I remember the last summer I was there, the chief engineer who's, by the way, still alive. And I went and talked at the Aerostar convention in Tulsa about 90 days ago. And he was in the audience and remembered me I remembered him, and I told this story that uh, my last year out there, uh, he pulled me aside and asked me what I was going to do, and I said, well, I'm going to graduate from school and maybe get a job working at Boeing or someplace. He said, you don't want to do that. They'll just put you in a little cubicle, and you'll end up spending 10 years writing reports, and you'll be bored to death. He said, you need to find a, a, different, a, a different way to be an aerospace engineer. <laughs> That's amazing, and 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 you're in our you you know basically spend all your time in our backyard here learning and and flying in those uh, New England conditions. That must have given you also a leg up on understanding how everything works. 
it was the best environment I can imagine to train somebody. And actually it saved my life about six years later. Um, one of the guys I was teaching to fly was a member of the local Civil Air Patrol. And he had landing rights at the Naval Air Station at Quonset Point that's just south down the bay from the municipal airport there at Providence, the Theodore Francis Green Airport. And so we had rights to go down there and shoot approaches and land at the Naval Air Station. Well, they didn't have an ILS. They had a GCA or a PAR. You know, how many people out here have ever actually flown one of those in, in anger? Uh, not very many anymore that are left. Uh, and so we'd go down there and shoot those, but the minimums for that approach were 100 feet and a quarter mile, not 200 feet and a half. And there's no, you know, category three then that hadn't been invented. And so we'd go down there in 182 and, and shoot them down to 100 feet and a quarter mile. Well, that was basically zero, zero. And we'd get out on the runway sometime and they'd have to give us vectors on the PAR system to taxi back to the beginning to take off. But it was just spectacular training for for instrument pilots to, you know, to to be able to do that. And you know, we'd take off, make a round robin out to New Bedford, to Hannesport, out to Nant uh, not to Nant well, sometimes to Nantucket. And Nantucket was socked in solid 330 nights a year. Uh, <laughs> most often, we'd go to Martha's Vineyard, and then make our way back to Providence. And the weather'd be down by the time we got back to Providence. And, you know, they'd get five or six for real approaches in and one uh, in one flight. Uh, and we'd get to do that, you know, two or three times a month, uh, you know, when the, you know, because the weather was just that way up there. Yeah. And so what yeah, brought you five, year, five years later, I got caught in a very unusual situation uh, going into Sydney, Nova Scotia from Newfoundland. And the weather clobbered up and it clobbered up everywhere. And there was no airport that was open. They were all closed for weather that was within range of the airplane. And I ended up shooting a for real, honest to God, uh, zero, zero landing uh, in a twin Cessna 320 uh, into Sydney, Nova Scotia. But I was able to make the decision to do that rather than doing something stupid, which was to fly 300 miles away, maybe to Newfoundland, Newfoundland and try and find a better weather and end up there at midnight with weather closed in like it always is and running out of gas. And so it was, you know, it's one of those classic hard pilot decisions, judgment calls as to what to do. But my judgment call was to shoot the zero zero there while I still had plenty of fuel and, and do that. And I did that only because I had the confidence from all the, all the approaches I'd shot at Quonset Point, you know, when I was uh, as, working as a flight instructor. Wow. That's amazing. So, so what brought you then back to Ada, and how did you hook up with Tim and and made the make the decision to start Gammy? So, Neil Armstrong walked on the moon in July of '69. I graduated in May of '70, and I thought I was going to go to work for NASA and help them go to Mars, put a man on Mars. Well, the problem was NASA had a different idea. And between the time Neil Armstrong landed on the moon and the time of my spring break in 1970, NASA had given out something like 36,000 pink slips to very experienced aerospace engineers, many of whom were flipping hamburgers in Los Angeles. And I needed to find another career path for a while. So I ended up going to law school. Uh, came home, helped my parents run the old family ranch where I'd grown up and then started practicing law. And Tim Rail moved a, a business and started a new business, uh, Dynamic Flight Structures, building mil military spare parts and brought it to Ada uh, on a state grant kind of promotion deal. And we got to be friends because uh, I was the lawyer for one of the people that helped put up the building. And uh, we got to talking about it and, and uh, he wanted to have his own business and I wanted to have a be back in the aerospace business. so. We partnered up in, in 94, and originally the idea was not to make fuel injectors. We were gonna make ventral fins for a bonanza and call it an exhale bonanza. <laughs> Ill-advised. We still got those parts <laughs> around here someplace that we initially <laughs> built at his facility. 
I'm glad you chose injectors. <laughs> so, well, when we got started doing that, I thought, you know, we ought to at least learn the ropes on how to do an STC by uh, doing something simple. I've got this other idea. And so we, we decided to focus on the fuel injectors until we learned how to do STCs. I'm still learning. <laughs> still learning. So, so tell me about that process. What was that involved uh, like getting it? And, and I mean, that, that was your first exposure to, uh, 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 to Carl Goulet. Is that correct? It was. Uh, we, the, the FAA told us we had to get a DER. I didn't even know what a DER was. And uh, so we started hunting for one. We found a guy in North Texas and we worked with him for two or three weeks. And he finally, thank God, very honestly said, I don't know enough about what you're doing to do this right, but there's another DER that does and you need to fire me and hire him. And so I called up a guy that was a retired continental engineer that was living in uh, El Paso, Texas, um, and got him on the phone. His name was Carl Goulet. And he'd been retired from Continental for several years and uh, was a DER. He did a lot of consulting work for RAM at the time. And so we got on the phone and he told me how much he wanted to charge an hour. And, and that was good. And he said, so tell me about this project, son. He, I, I was always, you know, his son. <laughs> and, uh, and so I told him, I said, well, you know, I want to make these fuel injectors and I want to tweak. I want to get a precision bench to make them. We've tried doing that. We can do that. And then adjust their fuel flows based on these fancy new engine monitors that we're starting to see in all these airplanes so that we can figure out how to get all the fuel air ratios balanced between the front cylinders and the rear cylinders. And he said, say that again and slow down. And so I told him again. And after the second time I ran through it, I'll never forget this. It got real quiet on the phone and he said, hot damn, somebody's finally going to fix this problem. <laughs> <laughs> I knew we had the right guy. Well, he, he came from Continental, right? Yes. And he knew the problem. He had known the problem for decades and he had tried to fix the problem on the Malibu and did not approach it, frankly, the right way. He told me so later that he wished he had, had thought of doing it the way that we thought of doing it. Uh, uh, because they, you know, the Malibu was supposed to be able to run lean. It was kind of the first production airplane that was really, 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 really designed to run with a lean mixture. So, uh, we got to work and, and, uh, uh, we had some problems, but we started that project in December of, uh, 95 and we ended up with the first STC in June of 96 and John Deacon, God bless him, bought the first set of game ejectors. Serial number 1001. There's a funny story with that because when we were starting to mark the first 10 boxes that we built and, and had qualified and all that, uh, the FA uh, inspector said, well, you got to have serial numbers on these. And I said, okay. And so I gave them to this guy to start putting serial numbers on there. And I went over and looked and he had 001, 002, 003. And I said, wait a minute, stop, stop, stop. Go back and redo those and start and go 1001, 1002, and start with 1000. And he looks at me, and the, the FAA guy looked at me and said, Why are you doing that? And I said, Because I'm not sure we'll ever sell 1000. <laughs> so I think we're like 37,000 serial numbers down the road now. Yeah, but everybody's got to start their serial numbers at something that's a little, uh, that, that doesn't let the people know that they're number one, right? <laughs> No, and, John, and John Deacon would not let me give him that set of fuel injectors. He insisted on paying for them. He's a good guy. That's amazing. I miss him greatly already. Yeah. He, uh, he I guess, uh, right in, 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 in line with you, talk about understanding all of that stuff. Uh, he, he was really something. Um, so that was kind of first step for Gammy. And then from there, you moved on to uh, the, was it the turbo world first or other things? No, it was basically the turbo world. What had happened was I had bought my, uh, my, my, uh, my wonderful 1967 V-tail in uh, August of 1991. I'd finally gotten out of debt, had a little money, and it was my anniversary on August the 8th. And on the afternoon of August the 8th, I said to my wife, uh, she and I were practicing law together in a little 
uh, frame building in, in Ada. I said, uh, hey, come on, go with me to the airport. I want to show you your, uh, your uh, anniversary present. <laughs> it takes a lot of nerve for a guy to do this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we got out the airport, and I'd arranged it with the maintenance shop that had the airplane in there, you know, polishing it up and, and, and uh, waxing it and whatnot. And they opened the door about uh, 3.30 that afternoon, and, and uh, there was uh, – November 1 1 Romeo Tango sitting there. And I said, uh, uh, Darling, this is your uh, this year anniversary present. <laughs> and I'm going to fly it for you. I said, You want to go fly? And she said, You bet. So we got in the plane and went flying. <laughs> uh, That's amazing. And so, how'd the turbo stuff come on after that? Well, uh, I bought the plane with a high time engine. And so, uh, the uh, uh, in the fall of '92, it was ready for a new Continental, and it had a 520 in it. So I wanted to upgrade it to a 550. So I got that uh, STC to do that. Got a 550 ordered. Got it installed. Uh, you know, at the time there was not even a maintenance shop uh, in Ada. There was a paint shop, but not a real maintenance shop. Uh, but I had a good shop uh, just west of here, and the guy over there put the engine in, and I had him put one of those newfangled uh, uh, gym engine monitors uh, in, the, in the airplane. And so I had that, and oh, it was, a, it was kind of a good story because that was the year of Continental Strike. And they, the, the, as Carl Golay later told me, he said, well, the, the reason the quality control and all the engines went to hell that, uh, that year was because management went down on the floor and started trying to build engines. <laughs> bad idea. Really bad idea, as he, and he acknowledged. Uh, and uh, he gave me some other tips on what, was, what went wrong. But so fast forward, and I read or heard stories about this company out in Colorado in Pagosa Springs called uh, uh, Flightcraft that was putting turbos. Well, I had put 4,000 hours on a Cessna 320 with a pair of uh, TSL 520D turbocharged engines. By God, I wanted a turbocharger. I mean, that was, that was duck soup to me. Uh, and uh, so uh, I took the airplane out there, made a deal. They put a turbo on it, and, and, and I flew it home in, in I believe, uh, I don't know, August of 93, something like that and was flying it around and of course had been flying it around when we started game ejectors and the first thing i wanted to do was get turbo game ejectors because i'd been playing with running that engine with a lean mixture mm -hmm. and so we got the turbo game ejectors done uh, with some more help from carl Goulet. i remember a flight carl and i made to twenty-seven thousand feet or something uh, uh for the certification flight for the turbo fuel injectors in that bonanza uh, and so we got that going and, and on, actually on the way back to the airport from that uh, flight, uh, Carl wanted me to show him how the engine reacted if it was run with a lean mixture. And I looked at him like, that's a, you know, Continental never run an engine with a lean mixture. And so he did this weird deal where he put his head against the window and one hand on the dash and one hand on the ceiling. Said, now lean it out. And so I did what we would now call a gammy lean test, uh, lean in the mixture. And uh, he's feeling for vibration with his hands and his head against the window. And so I did it once. He said, do that again, son. So I did it again. He said, well, do that a another time. And I did it another time. And he sat there a minute and he looked at me and he said, it took me three years to get a Malibu to run smooth lean a peak. And you've done this in six months. <laughs> and I, so, you know, we got on the ground and I pulled him aside and I said, Carl, is there anything wrong with running one of these engines with a lean mixture? And he came out with a famous quote that uh, John Deacon borrowed and often used, as, as did Walter Atkinson teaching the APS classes. And that was that, well, son, you know, I tell people around Continental when I can get them to listen that running these engines with lean mixtures uh, is cleaner 
and running them with lean mixtures is cooler and cleaner and cooler is always better for these engines. Oh, I got it. <laughs> and it took 10 years to convince the, the piston engine aviation world that, uh, that Carl was right. Yeah. Yeah. So tonight's main focus we want to make sure we get to here is of course, alternative fuels and your phone is ringing off the hook, especially within the last couple of weeks. What is going on in California as a starting point? Well, it's it's coming kind of come and gone in, in three phases, but the third phase started again literally yesterday. Uh, first phase was about a week after Oshkosh when the first G100 UL AVGAS STCs, uh, uh, you know, were announced on that Tuesday uh, panel discussion with, uh, you know, with AOPA and Gamma and uh, Jack Pelton at EAA and then Earl Lawrence, who's the Air One in charge of all certification, <clears throat> excuse me, for the FAA. So I got home from Oshkosh about a week after we got home from Oshkosh phone started ringing off the wall from California. And then from a number of other places, it kind of surprised me. Uh, I probably ought not to name names, but, you know, some other airports in a, a bunch of other states, not just, you know, uh, west of the Sierra Nevada. And, you know, they're concerned and uh, really concerned. And then, of course, the people in California are hyper concerned. Um, and then you know, I, I started working with them and telling them where we were. And I said, look, we've got to expand the STC. The initial STC is for a limited number of airplanes. And they said, yeah, that really worries us. It's just a small number of Cessnas and a small number of engines. And, you know, uh, so how are you going to get, you know, to my airplane and my engines are all the airplanes on the airport at, uh, uh, at Bakersfield or all the airplanes on the airport at Reed Hillview or Palo Alto or, you know, all the, you know, all those airports. And I said, well, we've got this program where we're going to uh, add and expand the approved model list, and it's going to take us another year. But by the time you know we get to the second quarter, end of the second quarter of next year, we'll have uh, all the airplanes and all the engines that are in the, uh, you know, all the spark ignition piston engines and the associated airplanes that are in the FAA's database of type certificate data sheets. And well, you know, boy, we're afraid something else is going to happen. Well. Sure enough, I get a phone call from uh, uh, the one of the county commissioner, maybe the president of the county commissioner or somebody, plus the uh, manager of roads and airports from Santa Clara County in September or something. And they tell me that, I think it was August the 12th, but I'm not sure of the date, that uh, Santa Clara County commissioners took a vote to terminate all of or, or non-renew uh, or terminate all of the fueling leases for all the airports in Santa Clara County. Think about that one a minute. And I said, so what's that mean? And that means, well, that means that starting at, you know, 12.01 a.m. on January 1st, 2022, that the only fueling is going to be done by the County of Santa Clara County, and there will be no 100 low lead sold. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, the 30 year love affair with the problem, finding a solution to, you know, leaded fuel, the 30 year love affair that's gone on between the industry and the FAA is suddenly coming to a, a, a crashing finale. Uh, and so, you know, that, that word started to leak out that that was on the agenda and Oh, frankly, nobody was taking it seriously. Oh, surely that's not going to happen. La di da di da. Well, uh, yeah, I think I think people think of this uh, uh, as a problem that that will eventually be solved, will eventually come to a head, and if it does, it's going to be the EPA fighting the FAA, and there's going to be a lot of time and people involved in trying to resolve it. But what you're describing is that this thing's coming to a head immediately at some airports because it's being dealt with at the at the local level it's being stopped 
And so I believe yesterday, the uh, Santa Clara County sent out an email and put it on their website to all the pilots at uh, two airports out there, Reed Hillview and H E, you know, H sixteen, one of the others out there. And they sent out a notice and said, you know, as of December thirty first, there will no longer be hundred low lead sales at those two airports. Parade rest. You know. Never, never, never is now now. You know, hmm. It's not four years or six years from now. It's not a paffy pipe dream of of, you know, how long can we keep studying and loving the problem? Uh, the problem is is at our doorstep today. Uh, you know, we're December 7th. God bless the United States. Uh, and we're, what, uh, 24 days from January 1st? You know, we're three weeks away from, yep. uh, from airplanes potentially being stranded. And frankly, in my view, it's a continuing operational safety problem. That's a COS and FAA lingo. A continuing operational safety problem, and nobody has recognized it yet, because what's going to happen is you're going to have people out there that decide they can maybe get away with, you know, leaving a half a tank of hundred low lead and filling it up with a half a tank of car gas or a half a tank of uh, ninety four UL or something like that, and they can get away flying the airplane that way, uh, and you know. They're going to be airplane engines that have real problems doing that. Yeah. And of course, it's always an issue when you remove fuel from an airport that people are used to and there's safety issues there and, and, and all, all sorts of stuff around it. So you tell me how you guys created G100 UL. I mean, you you've, have a solution to this, but then there's still a supply chain challenge. But tell me, tell me about the, the solution. Well... We've gone through kind of three crisis periods on unleaded air gas. It started in in the 1990s. There was a environmental crisis, and then it kind of went away. And then the Obama administration came in, and we had a real crisis in 2009 timeframe. And this was the this was the single most talked talk topic at the AOPA convention in Florida in the fall of 2009. And we'd had a bunch of experience with different fuels because uh, during the uh, uh, mid-2000 time frame, three different major refining companies, uh, one overseas and two here in the United States, who did not trust the FAA's test to be confidential and private, uh, they sent fuel to us and had us test it privately for detonation characteristics. And so we had we had a fair amount of experience doing that. Uh, none of those fields would work uh, for various different reasons, uh, but we learned a lot from that, and we had developed some notions on our own as to what might work. So when Tim and I were flying back in, in, in my wife's anniversary present from Florida, uh, we had a discussion on the way back and said, maybe we ought to try and come up with a fuel. I think that was like October early November, something like that, for that AOPA convention. And about the third week in December, we filed the first patent application and and went to work, filed an STC right with it and opened the first STC. And so, yeah, it's been 12 years, folks, 12 years this month since wow. we filed the STC. It's is just there, unconscionable. Is there uh, anything about that kind of secret sauce that, that you can tell people anything at all about where, what, where it, it, it comes from in general that, that helps people understand why you were able to solve the problem? Well, um, 95 plus percent of what's in that field is stuff that's in gasolines that people put in their cars and their airplanes every day. It was just a question of picking the right you know, the, the, if you will, uh, selecting, uh, 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 you know, the, the right fruits and vegetables out of the garden. Mm -hmm. But it was a garden everybody had been, you know, eating out of and living out of forever. And it was just a question of, of knowing, you know, 
knowing which varieties of which fruits in the garden to pick, uh, you know, to make the salad and and uh, 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 and and make the dinner with. Um, and so, in that sense, there's nothing about you know the fundamental nature of the molecules that are in there. There's traditional aviation alkalate. There's traditional uh, uh, aviation, uh, you know, isopentane for vapor pressure and stuff like that. Uh, there's some aromatics in there. Uh, aromatics have been in aviation gasoline in different levels. Good Lord, going back to before World War II. Uh, most people don't realize that the aromatic content of aviation gasolines uh, went up a whole bunch right before D-Day. Mm. The, the fuel tank, the fuel tank float folks now. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I mean, they went from a, uh, you know, basically a 100, 130 kind of gasoline and they got a 100, 150 gasoline about two months before D-Day. Uh, and it let them crank up the, the, the red line manifold pressure on, you know, the Spitfires and the, and the Corsairs and the, and the P-51s and, and all those airplanes, you know, which was kind of nice. Uh, a nice surprise for for the German Luftwaffe uh, uh, at D-Day time. So you know, like I say, there's it's a unique formulation. Nobody's ever put it together this way, and so there's patents and stuff on it. And you know, you can go to the patent literature and learn a lot about it, but maybe not everything there is to know about it. Uh, uh, so then we started it to to get it certified, and. Uh, there were at least some people in the FAA that thought we should go through ASTM, and we declined to do that because the ability of ASTM to protect intellectual property was severely compromised, as we learned to our dismay in the first six months or so that we started the project. Mm. Um, we declined to get in the PAFI project because we, we asked the FAA two questions. If we get in the PAFI project in 2013 or something when they finally got it started, do we get credit for all the certification work you already signed off on that's already in our file? And they said, no, you got to start over again. The other question we asked them was, well, if we start doing this through the PAFI project and we get down the road a year or two and we decide we need to tweak the fuel formula or specification a little bit, uh, are we going to be allowed to do that? Oh, no, no, you have to go back and start all over again, and that's not going to be allowed in the PAFI program. You know, you're one and done when you come into the program. And I said, well, that's not the way that real research and development is done, for God's sakes. I mean, that's just not the way it's done. Uh, and, uh, you know, if the, if the Wright brothers had been limited to that, then they never would have flown at Kitty Hawk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we said, thank you, but no thank you. We're going to keep doing the STC. And boy, was that ever the right decision. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the things that people certainly have asked, I just want to reiterate, because I think you did answer it. You first came out, obviously, at AirVenture with the uh, uh, limited airframe and engine STCs. But, of course, that was just the first step in the process. And you're expecting within the next 12 months, uh, certainly, to basically cover all airframes and all engines. Is that correct? Yes. I can't elaborate. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, you know, when we first got ready to do these STCs, I told the FAA guys that, and let me back up a second. This project was completely stalled in June a year ago, June of 2020. And give credit, you know, make your donations, whatever, to AOPA, because the president of AOPA learned about the fact that this project was stalled. And he went to Air One in the FAA. A guy named Beryl Lawrence sits in the corner office in, at 800 Independence Avenue in the FAA building in Washington. And he went to Earl Lawrence and said, hey, look, you know, we've got an election coming up. We could have a new EPA administrator. We really need to move the football down the field. And to his everlasting credit, about two weeks later, uh, Air One, Earl Lawrence, and er remember, Earl used to work at EAA. He helped do the EA auto fuel STC. He knows STCs and fuels from personal experience. The right guy in the right place at the right time. 
Yep. He calls me up on the phone and says, George, I've been looking at your certification file on this U100 ULA guest. He said, this project's taken at least five years too long and it's had too, way too much regulatory involvement and not near enough uh, progress and certification. And so I'm going to let the people that have been working your project go do something else for a while. And I'm going to put a whole new team in charge. Jeff, there's a word for that. You know what it is? It's called <laughs> leadership. <laughs> leadership, for God's sakes. It's called leadership. And so he did. And I thought, oh, God, this is going to be terrible. We're going to have to educate all these people and they'll have to learn the nine year history of the project. And, you know, scared me to death. But he, he reassured me, said, no, this is going to be a bunch of bright, smart people that have got some experience. They'll, they'll catch on, you know, and, and, and you need to do this, George. I said, OK. So we started in uh, the last week in July. As a matter of fact, the FA guys that got a sign got a sign on July 23rd, 2020. If you look, the date on the STCs was July 23rd, 2021. Wow. 365 days later, we had the first STCs. And working with those guys has been like, it's the way certification ought to be done. Somebody ought to write a case study for the FAA on how to do certification projects uh, on a on a proper basis. Uh, it's been focused on the data. Uh, they've been timely. Uh, we've had a Zoom call virtually every Tuesday afternoon. Today's Tuesday, by the way, at three o'clock today, we spent an hour and 15 minutes on the phone on the Zoom going over where we are on the project. Uh, and it's actually relevant to your question. So at any rate, about 60 days after the STCs came out in July, we had the first of two planned expansion stages. Uh, and that was to, uh, to add an intermediate large group of engines and aircraft. And so it kind of caught a lot of people by surprise, but there were 611 engines added to the STC about uh, 35, 45 days ago. Mm -hmm. And as of today, the FAA signed off on the paperwork for the next tranche of aircraft that go with those 611 engines. And I think there's 42 pages in the AML expansion for the aircraft that go with those engines. You know, there's, I don't know, I hadn't counted them yet, but there's 1,200, 1,500, 1,700 aircraft making models. Uh, and, you know, as soon as the typing pool, the, God bless the lady that does this up at uh, the FAA's office, you know, as soon as she gets through preparing the, the AML list, then uh, that's a done deal for that uh, uh, phase one of two expansion. And then phase two of two uh, is to get the rest of them, which is actually a smaller number, but it includes more of the high powered, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, aircraft and engines. And we've agreed to run two more tests. They're tests that are repeat tests of tests we've already done successfully. Uh, we did that just as a matter of completeness and to keep other people from criticizing us because somebody else might have had a different idea of how it should have been done. Uh, and so yeah, I'm hoping to get all that done by the uh, end of the second quarter next year. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. It's a one flight test on a PA-32 with an IO-540K and then another 150-hour engine block test, which we're going to do right here in this test stand that's behind me. Uh, by the way, we couldn't have done this without this test stand hmm. because we had the ability to go out and make a barrel of fuel in the morning, bring it out here and put it on that test stand behind that glass window, that four inch thick glass window, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and you notice my head's down here below the window. And that's <laughs> something goes wrong out there. All the parts come through and hit the wall over my head. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but you know, it, 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 by five o'clock that afternoon, we could know whether it worked or not. And the next morning we could rinse, wash and repeat and, and do that over and over and over and over again until we found something that worked. You know, it was kind of like the Edison deal. He kept making filaments until he finally found a filament substance that would work. But we did a lot of that kind of, you know, heavy duty, uh, work. Uh, so, uh, we, uh, we, uh, do anticipate having the approved model list uh, expanded so that, uh, so far as I can tell, it's going to include 
at the present time, uh, all of the spark ignition piston engines uh, in the FAA's uh, uh, database of type certificates and all of the corresponding aircraft. Wow. Uh, that becomes, you know, it, there's all kinds of controversy about the term fleet wide, but whatever you want to, you know, uh, you know, dither or dally or dis dispute or debate about the meaning of that term, this looks to me like a, at least a functional fleet wide approval of a high octane unleaded AVE gas. That's amazing. Now, when you do that, of course, you've got both the engine side, which you're working, you, you've mentioned here in the test stand and making sure it meets all those parameters there. And then, of course, you mentioned all the airframes. And just as it was with the Peterson STC and auto fuel, you've got the same kind of challenges about compatibility. And, and uh, on one hand, does it perform and do everything you need on the engines? On the other hand, on airframe. Can you talk to me a little bit about what differences there might be, if any, on the engine side and then also on the airframe side? So that's a really good question. And I'm, I'm, I'm very glad you asked the question because <clears throat> um, most people don't realize this. And frankly, a bunch of the outsiders uh, have uh, complained. You know, when I say outsiders, I'm talking about uh, you know, some of the OEMs, you know, like Home and Continental, uh, some of the other airframe people, well, you know, GAMI's doing this project in secret. Nobody knows what the heck they're doing, and uh, there's not been any transparency. Uh, and they don't have any subject matter experts, you know, famous <laughs> acronym SMEs. Uh, all that's complete nonsense. It's been said by people that don't have a clue about the reality of the situation. So, for example, the first 150-hour engine block test, you know, the 150-hour famous, you know, certified new engine block test, well, we didn't do that test. Embry-Riddle did that test. We never set foot in the state of Florida while that test was being done. The project engineer on our project was out of the Atlanta office, and he was driving down to, to Daytona to Embry-Riddle about once a week to supervise that. And Embry-Riddle did the test. We made the fuel here, shipped it to Florida. Uh, and Emory Riddle did the test. Their engineers wrote the reports, and uh, the the FAA approved the reports. Uh, that's about as independent third party as it gets. I, I I would like you to identify for me any certification project that any other major OEM has ever done, where they farmed out the certification work to somebody that's that uh, that that's much separated from uh, from their own facilities. Uh, God bless them. Uh, Pat Waddock at Cirrus got a hold of us back in 2012 and said, hey, we've got kind of a unique construction of our fuel tanks. You know, they're fiberglass epoxy with carbon fiber and sealants. Uh, can we get some of your fuel and do some testing? I said, well, by the way, we need to do some material compatibility testing for credit with the FAA. Would you mind helping us do that? Uh, no, we don't. We don't mind. We'll do it, period. And so we sent them fuel and they ran the same series of tests on their wetted wings that they had run to qualify that material for 100 low lead, you know, five or seven years before. They used the same test planes, they just changed the name, you know, mm -hmm. from 100 UL to G100UL. Reran the same test, wrote the reports, and the FAA approved them. You know, that's a pretty significant level of third party uh, oversight. Absolutely. Uh, uh, and, and a bunch more of that has taken place, but. In addition to that, all the way back in 2010, a test pilot from Lycoming came to Ada, flew the airplane, you know, 100 low lead in one wing and G100 in the other wing with that beautiful uh, uh, data uh, acquisition system that's built into the uh, turbo normalized Cirrus uh, Avidyne system. And then flight test pilot for Continental, uh, I believe it was, I think it was Bill Brogdon came out and did the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Alan Klapmeyer from Cirrus came down and did the same thing. And then an FAA test pilot out of Fort Worth came down and, and, and did the same thing. Oh, he did it on a day when it was colder than hell to do uh, uh, cold weather operational stuff. Uh, all of that was, you know, outside people and all of it said, no, this, you cannot tell the difference in the airplane from yep. switching from the left tank to the right tank, even with that beautiful instrumentation up there. The only person that could tell a difference was Alan Klapmeyer. 
And he figured out at Lena Peak at say 17.3 gallons an hour at 10,000 feet at 30 inches and 2,500 or something, that the airplane was about a knot and a half faster on the right tank than it was the left tank. And he looks at me and says, why is that? I said, well, you're Lena Peak. He said, well, yeah, but it's the same fuel flow. And I said, well, yeah, but the energy content of the G100 is very slightly higher. And so even at the same fuel flow, you're not quite as many degrees lean of peak and the engine's making slightly more horsepower. So if you pull the fuel flow back three tenths of a gallon an hour, they'll be at the same speed. And he did it, said, I'll be damned. <laughs> he was so, the only one that picked up on that. So, you, so as opposed to some people who might have concerns about less fuel efficiency, you're saying the G100 UL is actually more fuel efficient. So the fuel weighs a slightly more per gallon, mm -hmm. but it has slightly higher BTU content per gallon. So it's so the same number of gallons. There's, you know, 1%, 1.5% or something more energy content per every gallon that goes through the fuel injectors. Right. The gam ejectors. <laughs> right. Exactly. The gam ejectors. <laughs> and, uh, and so therefore, when you're when you're lean a peak at the same volumetric fuel flow, uh, the engine's going to make very slightly more horsepower. And if you leave it on the autopilot and you repeat it enough times to get accurate data, you can actually see a really trivial change in airspeed. And that's the only only thing you can see. Uh, the FAA was really worried about, well, you know, there may be a difference in vapor pressure. Four FAA engineers came to Aid Oklahoma on September 5th, 2012 and supervised flight tests back to back 100 low lead. We made one flight to 26,000 feet on 100 low lead and that had been specially tweaked on the ground to the maximum vapor pressure allowed by the spec. And then we'd heated the fuel to 105 degrees when it went into the wing tanks. Went up and flew it to altitude, did restarts, came down, changed to drain the tanks, filled the tanks with the G100 U, uh, UL and did a rinse wash and repeat to altitude and back down again. Then we sat down and downloaded the data on the spot and the FAA people went over to uh, sitting in our conference room for three hours that afternoon. And you could hold two identical plots from the downloaded data side by side. Uh, and if you blacked out the, you know, the, the time of day when the engine run took place, nobody could tell the difference. Right. And the, and, you know, at, at one time or another, there's been, so help me God, 22 different FAA senior engineers and managers mm -hmm. that have been part of the certification effort on this project. And I believe 12 of them have been to Aid Oklahoma, including the manager of the engine propeller directorate in Burlington, Massachusetts. Uh, just, you know, the, the level of FAA involvement and oversight uh, has been extraordinary, to say the yeah. least. And so to answer people's questions, then no concern or compatibility issues with fuel bladders, O-rings, components, things along there, nothing that, that's kind of hiding in there that people have to worry about that even, perhaps even skeptics might say was good enough for FA certification, but still creates a, an, an issue down the road. Just like aromatics ended up causing, time, as the 100 low lead changed, slowly caused you know more issues for bladders. You're not concerned about any of that for G100 uh, uh, UL. That was one of the early things that we had to, satisfy ourselves with we'd been fools to go down the road and leave that till the end so the first two things we did was detonation testing and material compatibility i'd already done the flight testing to realize there wasn't any difference mm -hmm. and so we started proposing different ways and the faa guy that was working the project then a guy named uh, uh, kevin brain out of atlanta really smart good guy he said well i think you need to do a rig test he said, I want you to rig up and put fuel pumps and bladders and all the wetted components in the airframe and the engine and circulate fuel from them through them for a few months. Uh, and then let's tear all those parts down and examine them and, and cut open the bladders. So we built a rig, had three different fuel bladders. One of them was a brand new 1954 bladder out of a box. Never been on the, out of the box before. <laughs> Another one was a 20-year-old barren bladder out of the wing of a, in a junkyard for God's sakes, uh, and I've forgotten what the third one was. And then we had all the fuel pumps rigged up, 
driven by electric motors with electric heaters on the fuel pumps so they'd be running at engine temperature during the we ran that for six months like that the fa guy came out about once every six weeks to ins and ins inspect it i i took that material compatibility rig test and did a presentation for uh for astm uh just about the time the PAFI project was getting started and the lady uh, uh melanie tom was her name that was going to be in charge of doing the material compatibility testing for PAFI saw it up on the screen and during the Q&A period, she raised her hand and said, hey, uh, George, uh, I really like that test rig you've got up there. Can can you send me the drawings for that so that we can use it for the PAPI program? <laughs> and sure. And we did. And they did. I mean, wow. So, yeah, the answer to your question is we've been there and done that. Excellent. Excellent. So, I mean, the biggest thing is, is obviously our time starts to wrap up that people really, it gets to the the next one, which is, how is this going to get distributed? How is this going to get out there? And when it finally does get distributed, what's it going to cost? So cost is always uh, the one that the pilots always start to ask about first. Uh, of course, car gas in California someplace a month ago was $7 a gallon, uh, for God's sakes. Uh, so in terms of the distribution, uh, we have been in very intense talks uh with uh uh you know one of those uh companies whose names you'd recognize driving past gas stations driving down the street uh and we've got an nda in place we've been having uh weekly zoom meetings with their senior technical people uh and they're pretty interested we spent an hour and a half on the phone with them uh yesterday and we've got another hour and a half scheduled thursday uh, they're down to the nuts and bolts of, you know, how do we optimize the, the making of this fuel? So they may be the ones that produce it. If not, there's a couple other people that we're already talking to. Uh, and uh, uh, so, you know, the fuel can be produced. It can be produced in traditional refining facilities. Uh, it can be shipped, you know, in tank cars and trucks and, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, that's the game plan on how to get that done. Um, uh, you know, it's not easy. Uh, you know, there's, you know, it's new and anything that's new, you know, worries people and that's, you know, perfectly understandable. Um, what was your other question? Well, to answer the, the, the hundreds of questions coming oh, in and want to know compared to hundred low lead. <laughs> so let's put uh, that in relative terms, not the $7, uh, uh, California fuel. Yeah. So uh, the last time I actually had time uh, to sit down and, uh, and run the numbers was really three years ago. And I ran the spreadsheet numbers. And at that time, based on the cost of petroleum and all the components and everything else, we were estimating that the cost of the fuel as it came through the fence or the front gate of the refinery uh, you know, loaded on the truck or the rail cars, it was going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 65 to 90, maybe 95 cents a gallon more than existing 100 low lead. Uh, uh, that's not, you know, that's significant, but the alternative is an order of magnitude more significant. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that's kind of where we think it's going to be. Uh, it changes you know, with the price of petroleum and the price of the components. Uh, but that that's what it looks like. Now, you know, 100 low lead is going to get progressively very much more expensive over the next several years. If nothing else, the people that make the lead are going to start charging more and more from it, trying to milk the market as it finally evaporates and goes away. I mean, that's just standard business model pricing 101. Uh, but that's the uh, that's the the right neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So roughly somewhere just shy of a dollar a gallon wouldn't wouldn't be unexpected to the consumer as to what they would compare it to with hundred low lead. Although, like you said, it's against the backdrop of changing prices because hundred low lead is going to start going up. Well, and keep in mind the more the more important offset, the maintenance for the engine should get dramatically less expensive. Smart mm. plug changes all change we all changes ought to go to you know three times 
the oil change interval that we've got now. Yeah. Maybe longer. Uh, you should be able to use synthetic motor oil for a change. Mm -hmm. uh, synthetic motor oil means cooler cylinder head temperatures uh, and potentially even longer fuel uh, oil change intervals. You know, uh, oil change intervals for an active pilot that flies 30 hours a month or something, that's a real pain in the backside. Yeah. Uh, and it's a it's a dispatchability problem. Uh, uh, you know, when right. can I, you know, get my airplane out of the shop to go to grandmother's house for Thanksgiving or Christmas? Uh, yep. the, so the maintenance issues. Uh, ultimately, there's it's not an unreasonable hope that uh, maybe it might have a, a positive influence on TBOs on these engines. So there's some serious offsets for right. the price increase in the fuel. Well, there's, there's, you know, there's, there's legal TBO and there's practical TBO also in terms of when you start experiencing problems and you don't have a choice or even don't even call it practical TBO, but practical, practical need for maintenance. Right. And uh, if, if, if you're able to deliver things that have less contaminants without the lead and everything else, I would imagine exhaust valve issues that, that are caused by, you know, it doesn't take much, a little lead build up and, and you start it's not sealing an exhaust valve properly, you start burning a seat. I mean, I see that all day long. So I, I would imagine you'd start seeing a lot of benefits to that. Well, how, how, how often do you change spark plugs in, in most owners' airplanes or clean the, pull and clean the plugs? How often do you do that? Well, you got to do it annually, that's for sure. <laughs> you know, 100 hours if they fly a lot or annually if they don't. Well, how about 200, 300, 400 hours between cleaning spark plugs? Hmm. Just stuff like that that uh, is going to get uh, significantly better uh, without uh, lead in the fuel. Wow. Wow. And uh, um, I assume no issues uh, or you addressed already issues that with how, val how, how it uh, lead uh, benefits engines in terms of a, a lubricant in the valve train as well? Oh my God! Go back and do your homework, Jeff. <laughs> At least that's Glad the old wives' the tale. At least that's the old wives' tale. Can I say it that way? <laughs> There's a 1999 FAA study out of the Tech Center at Atlanta. I know City. that's not true. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I mean, you know, there's nothing good for an engine about lead other than octane. Nothing, and a lot bad, and you know. That concept that lead lubricates anything is just the biggest piece of misinformation. <laughs> it's worse than, you know, running your engine lean is going to burn it up. I figured I'd get a rise out of you. <laughs> <laughs> you did. Well, George, uh, what's the, wh where do people go to get updates on the latest stuff? You've got uh, new STCs uh, uh, coming out. Uh, well, new, same STC, new AML uh, editions, uh, a lot more coming up. People have tons and tons of questions, uh, obviously, about, uh, you know, whether it applies to their aircraft or things like that. We've got questions from experimental aircraft owners, of course, and how's it going to fit with all that? How did they get their questions answered other than tonight? Well, uh, this is this is very helpful, and and if, if we ever get a chance to do it again, I can maybe f uh, focus on some of that stuff. But uh, uh, our website, the Gammy website, has got some information. I'll be quite candid with you. I don't have time to keep it updated. I'm too busy doing certification work, and most people would rather I spend my time doing certification work than updating the the, the website. <laughs> for God's sakes. Uh, but uh, 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 you know, I've occasionally, I haven't had time to be on a message board of any kind since, uh, since Oshkosh. Uh, I mean, I thought you were going to say since the 1990s, <laughs> yeah, well, no, I've, I've, but I mean, you know, we're, you know, Tim and I, and some of our people are spending 12, 14 hours a day, six, seven days a week, uh, working this project as hard as we can. Uh, and so there's not a, there's not a lot of time for, you know, that kind of uh, that kind of public relations uh, activity, but uh, we keep we keep updating the website when we can. Okay, well, George, I want to thank you so much for taking time out to join us here tonight and at least help on this problem. 
Um, you're one of my heroes in the industry. You're one of the reasons that so many, I mean, things work the way they do from our injectors to, to the ability that people have to add turbos to their planes. And now, uh, really, I think that the pinnacle, the idea that you, that you could save all of us from the extinction of 100 low lead is, is truly amazing. And uh, I hope you'll come back on the show. We've got a million more things to talk about that we just couldn't obviously cover in a short period of time. Be glad to do it. Uh, just give me, give me some, give me some notice. <laughs> well, as always. All right, everybody. Well, that's uh, George Brawley. Thank you so much. Uh, appreciate everything that you do joining us here on Social Flight Live. And to all of you as well, thank you for taking time out of your evening. We will have a follow-up show with George. We'll go into much more detail as well, try to get a little more technical, try to get more questions answered along that. There's just only so much that you can do, obviously, in one quick show. With that, of course, we are back again every Tuesday, and we start with next Tuesday, December 14th, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, as always with Nicole Malkowski, the first female Thunderbirds pilot that will be joining us and telling us her amazing story. Uh, it really is uh, truly spectacular, the things that she's accomplished in her life. And uh, it, it's, it's groundbreaking to see what the many different things that she's done and been able to do, uh, do along the way. And with that, the following Tuesday is December 21st. That is Christmas week. And we have a tradition here of meeting directly with the insiders at the North American Aerospace Defense Command, or NORAD. And uh, I'm telling you, you want to tune in for this one. Um, they not only cover things that are just fun like the Santa Tracker, but they answer questions and they deal with some of the really tough topics about what is happening regarding national security and some of the intrusions and responses that they have had throughout the year and recently uh, in our national defense. So there's a lot of very relevant and very interesting information that we will be getting during that presentation. With that again, I'd like to thank you all for taking the time out to join us here on Social Flight. And I wish you all blue skies.